HiSec Buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. This is Talking in Stations, a show about EVE Online. Today in the station, I am your host, Artemis Albosa. Joining me today, we've also got Shen. Hello, hello. And also on the show, we've got Gregorin Musu. Good evening. Now, remind me, guys, who are you flying with nowadays? Shen, I think you're AOM, right? Yep. Right on. Gregorin, who do you fly with? I'm in Capital Fusion in Pandemic Horde. Right on. Capital, so not like the core, I'm unfamiliar with Pandemic Horde. So there's okay. Pandemic Horde Inc., which is the full new bro thing, right? Yeah. And then what, what's it uh, well, go from there? A couple of, e well, uh, after a while they added, within Mainline Horde, there was a Blessed Bean, which is basically P Pandemic Horde Inc., if you've, also, given your ESIs and been in the Alliance uh, two months and can fly basic doctrines. And there's Horde Armada, which has a couple of extra requirements beyond that, but it's essentially the next degree of that. And there's also Horde Vanguard, which is vouched or invite only, does a lot of the work keeping the Alliance functioning and has a lot of the... FCs and other people like that. And then a couple of years ago, like I think may, especially starting in 2019, they've the alliance has also brought in a, a few non-mainline corporations that have hit a history in other alliances, which it used to be that every corporation in Pandemic Cord was either uh, special specialized or, uh, in a certain language like beyond frontier is one of the earlier ones that they're a french corporation or a branch of mainline horde like pandemic horde blessed bean and vanguard are but uh, i th a couple of years ago they started bringing in others capital fusion was a long time circle of two corporation and then the the alliance that it was in before Horde was Triumvirate. Other corporations that ha have come in f into Horde are Blackwater USA, uh, which was a longtime PL corporation and was also in Black Legion for a bit. And uh, w Waffles was in Horde for nearly a year. I, w I was with Waffles when I joined Horde. Uh, but they're no longer in Horde, and there are a few others in the Alliance. Right on. So Horde just isn't the, the singular mass of new bros anymore. They've got other sort of individualized identities of corporations that are in there as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Right. I think uh, back your previous stint with TIS running the weekday show, you, you, were, you interviewed our CEO, Chasa, once or twice. Ah, oh, right on. I did recognize the name, but I my memory for yeah, what I have and I have not done is horrendous. One of those episodes, you brought him and a couple of other whaling FCs on. Since Chasa has his main notability is as a whaling FC. Right on. You know what? I'm glad you brought up whaling, because of all the things that I had to talk about, I forgot to do my standard, let's look at the Rorqual tracker and see who's losing Rorquals, because that is fun for me. Uh, today, it's been very slow on the Rorqual losses. It looks like we've only had Veni, Vidi, Vici, and Reckless Associates, so Cash and Cobalt Edge losing Rorks. Wait a minute, Brave does Wailing Fleets? Well, apparently Brave does whaling fleets. They did yeah. it out in cash, and they managed to catch something. So that's pretty cool. And this was a, a decently fit Rorqual. He still has the survey scanner in his mid slot. So PSA to you, Fireburner. Um, you'll want to have that Wetu out. Make sure you're refitting. 
Looks like Init caught another one. This time they're using Drekovac, so they've upgraded from their Kikimoras. I suppose that they could only use the 30 or so dudes they have instead of a few hundred. And once again, we're seeing triple drone nav and a survey scanner in the mids and an armor tank. Man. People armor tank their war clothes? Well, this guy did, but it didn't last. I'll tell you what. Uh, that's why you don't armor tank your war claw. Data Rid, we had one that had deep water hooligans dropping some supers on it, plus an initiative Kikimora fleet. That thing, I don't think it mattered how it was fit. It was going to die. Um, looking further down the list, all the way back to Sunday, Dreadbomb, lots, some, lost one in Catch, some stuff in Quirius, Malplays, Delric. Okay, so we still got losses generally all throughout the whole map, um, which is still good to see. It's just slightly slowing down a bit. It'll be interesting to see come Quadrant 4. All about that yield, bro. Bro, I mean, it, if you get that yield for five minutes and then die, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, um, that's interesting. Let's check on supers real quick. I, I might, I'm off the script and I apologize, but I just want to check in and see how we're doing. Tests, are you okay? You've lost three, looks like three ratting supers in Outer Passage. What's going on? Looks like in it and French Connection, which are... Um, Oh, yep, and it was there, too. Imperium, too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they have, uh... Okay. This was not meant to be a, an Allot episode, but when you've got a Hell with three empty mids and three empty rigs, I've got some serious questions for you. Um, I, I don't know what to do with that, to be honest with you, so I'm just going to close that kill mail. Looks like Initiative is still, um, like, the only member of the Imperium who's under the Test is Next banner. I should take that back. That's that's too fiery for this show. But it... Man. You haven't said Delve has fallen yet. Oh, yeah. Fair point. All right, let's get back on topic. We do have some actual news to discuss today. I mean, this is news, just keeping up with what's going on around the cluster. But uh, we have some other interesting things happening. First and foremost, you may have seen a phenomenal post by Sky, who has done an amazing job of a very difficult task, which is taking the vast amounts of data that we can get through EVE Online and the API and the ESI and stuff like that, and taking that to get a macro level view of a particular topic. In this particular case, he calls it the Novice Forgets Yearbook. He's done this multiple years now. And he goes through and sees what can we infer from the data on the usage of different frigates. And he does a whole in-depth look. I'll show you a quick preview because it's just really freaking cool. Um, but he even goes down to the, to the aspect of talking about the different paradigms of fitting your frigates how successful they are, what they're useful against, different upgrade paths. So this is just phenomenal work, and we're, we're going to be trying to get him on the show, as well as some other like frigate PvP experts to really dive into this and talk about if you're just starting out, what are you doing in frigates, what's the state of faction warfare, and uh, this frigate PvP and stuff, and, and take a look at that. Have you guys d dove into this much at all? Have you seen it? Yeah, when I was a new player starting out in the second quarter of 2019, uh, someone gave me a link to that, the most recent edition of that frigate uh, PvP yearbook. And since a lot of what I was doing at the time was going around and roaming uh, the LOSAC area where EVE University, near EVE University's various home systems since that's who I was flying with at the time. And in frigates, uh, mostly solo, and I died a lot more than I killed, but I think I learned a few useful lessons. Fair enough. Shen, in your, in your time in game, have you ever done the low-sec frigate PvP thing, or did you just jump straight into the null-sec uh, large fleet battles? Yeah, I jumped straight to from high-sec to null-sec. But in null-sec, I do fly uh, interceptors, uh, which is like one of the few uh, frigate-sized uh, ships that will be listed in a doctrine list. 
I, I, I do enjoy flying interceptors as well. Like they're really fun, they're really fast. And it's like, you're basically speed tanking everything. And it's like, you're basically making them all like not able to track you. And it's, it's, it's a good feeling to be able to do, like say catch someone and then, because a lot of times uh, fleets, they, they need that interceptor pilot to catch something so they can go on there and to actually kill the person. Right, so like if uh, a lot of times you will need uh, interceptor pilots and interdictor pilots, so and I often would like to do that role. Yeah, yeah right. I like flying interceptors. I flew them honestly. I flew interceptors mostly on an alt. A lot of the time, I would fly Lodgy and then have an alt and an interceptor when I was doing the the small gang PvP thing. So I'm, although I did back in the day buy like a hundred the the typical the perennial eve advice if you want to learn pvp buy a hundred frigates go lose them all in in faction warfare low sec i did that i bought like breachers and rifters and tristans tristans were my favorite um i don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole but i flew the old uh medium shield extender tristan with a warp disruptor and then just your drones and so it was all a matter of if they defang you you lose but you probably aren't going to die because they can't catch you. With the exception of as people got better with their ABs, most frigates are fast enough to slingshot you, which is a, a more advanced manual piloting maneuver. But we won't get too far into that. There are far more expertise, or people with far more expertise on this topic than I, who should be talking about it, and we'll, we'll keep you updated on when we get that show scheduled. In other news, I did want to check in with what's going on down in the south west southeast excuse me with fire coalition so if we have a look at the map um as as far as i can tell just looking at the timer boards looking at the kill boards it seems like the vast majority of the fighting or at least the the most heavily contested fighting is occurring in Tenerifis. and so here in or not Tenerifis, immensi is where the sob is changing hands but we're also seeing crazy stuff happening in Tenerife. So let's take a look at the map. If we look at iHubs, you can see just a good third of Tenerife has zero iHubs. If we swap over to TCUs, um, the TCUs have been collected by Dreadbomb. They're the AT0 ticker. But it isn't like properly owned or used by them by any stretch because the iHubs are gone. If you're unfamiliar with SOV mechanics, the, the TCU is a flag, and that's just about it. The iHub controls a lot of stuff in terms of system indexes, in terms of what upgrades you can put into it to upgrade the value of your space. So if you're looking at who has control of a system, you really should care about the iHubs as opposed to the TCUs. So even though it looks like Dreadbomb has a lot of space in here, if we check the TCUs, they haven't fully commanded ownership of this space yet. But of course, that also means neither has Fireco. So that's an interesting thing to keep a look at. Am I seeing some crazy things here? So if we look in this top, what is this? The top right corner, the TCUs, AOM, has all these TCUs up here next to the, the corner of Immensi and Detroit and Omist. But the iHubs are still owned by XIX. Correct me if I'm wrong, Shen, but those are two different sides of the conflict, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, yeah, it, we own, we used to own that place, but uh, XX took it basically. Yeah. Ah, right on. You know what? Let's talk about the the initial state of who owned quote unquote what before the war started, because I think that's a really great way. To, to better wrap our head around the conflict. At the moment, if you look at a dot land map, or you look at a timer history, or you look at a Z kill board, you're gonna see a mess of stuff changing hands, but that doesn't tell you much about who's winning, who's lo losing, is the conflict just spinning up, is it dying down? Like, we need the context of where things started. And I'm hopeful that you can give us some of that context. So if we're looking at the overall universe map, the current state right now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my best guess, Shen, Tell me if I say something wrong. So my best guess is that AOM started out in Esoteria, and then Fireco. Uh, do you mean before the war, like w like the war between uh, Fire and RC, or do you mean the mm -hmm. big big war that just ended? Just before or... the war of Fireco and uh, RC and AOM. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. That one. Yeah. So I'm thinking um, Alum had Esoteria and Omist. And then where else do we want to look? I think those are the only two. I think you guys wanted Faith, but I'm betting Fireco beat you to it. And then we had Dreadbomb, who started out in Providence, extended into Catch in the Big War, and are since pushing out into Immensi and Tenerifus. Fireco itself, I think they extended from over further on the east, right? Did they start out in Cash or Detrit? Uh, I don't think they were in Cash. Definitely Cash, Detrid, though, right? Yeah. Cash has been Reckless Contingency, which uh, used to live in NC space in Malpais, but I, no, I no. guess they're now moving into having their own region. And then in some other Wicked Creek. So it looks like Fireco has a lot of space further up into the, up into the west. And then they sort of, this tendril extended down across the map into this south uh, cluster of regions with Catch, Amensi, Tenerifus, Impass, Faithabalus. And obviously that's right in the middle of the space that uh, AOM wants, and it's right adjacent to Dreadbomb, which is where the, the conflict is currently kicking off. Have I characterized the situation accurately, at least at the start of things? Uh, yeah, to uh, to a good degree, but I don't think we really want how I don't know how much we want faith of all this to be honest. Uh, yeah, because I, uh, you also if uh, if you want you can include impasse into it because I think uh, Red Alliance uh, and its coalition is so so somewhat involved to some degree in this conflict, but uh, their their involvement is really little. That is so weird. I'm I'm not gonna lie. Um. Well, number one, Red Alliance just being an impasse without having much connection to other groups. Because that is a, a strange region, or a difficult region, I would imagine, to be an island in. Because you're connected to Catch, Tenerifus, and Faith of Ballas, all of which are heavily embroiled in this conflict. I would be very surprised if Red manages to, to stay out of this war with every single neighboring region being engulfed in it. Um, yeah, wasn't Red Alliance in Fire Coalition before they uh, flipped to the Imperium or something like that? I'm going to be honest, my memory on those sorts of moves is horrendous, but we'll definitely take a look out and see if we can't confirm or deny that. Uh, we got some info coming through in the chat saying that Cash used to be owned by NSH, but then NSH left and they gave it to some other folks, Yeah, which I is interesting. Yeah, like I said, Recon has been living there now, and I think that's been the case since NSH moved out. Right on. And Nalsuchnia, NSH is uh, Nalsuchnia Srilopan. Yeah. Nobody can pronounce that correctly, so I don't even feel bad. It um, That was the group who you may recall was involved in some drama with Northern Coalition. Northern Coalition had a few high-profile corporations and high-profile FCs who, in the middle of the war with the Imperium, while NC was still part of Pappy, decided that they weren't happy with the state of the war or the state of their alliance and left to go join NSH. And NSH, if memory serves, recently started up a conflict against RC, but I'm pretty sure that has now officially fizzled out. Um, there might still be some ongoing hostilities and conflicts, but I don't think it's a existential threat of any sense. Yeah, for I think Reckon that's Coalition. mostly fizzled out. Uh, they might still have some fights, but I haven't seen any big fights with that recently. Right on. So we, we've got our starting frame of reference now. In terms of where we're looking at the moment, Tenerifis is just a mess. Um, Fire Co. has seemingly added some space to their repertoire, as well as um, Dreadbomb taking some stuff. If we look at Impasse as well, because I think that's another interesting one, that's where a lot of the timers are actively being contested. It's also a big old mess with Fire Co. holding some space, but in general it just doesn't seem like a livable region. Speaking of which, let me check the ADMs. When we're looking at Sawspace and trying to figure out what's going on, 
it's interesting to look at the ADMs in areas that have both iHub and TCU conquered because that can tell you was a group living there previously and are they still able to use the space. So if we look at this uh, constellation, specifically these two right next to Detrit and Tenerifis, they're currently owned by XIX, members of Fireco, and they have super high ADMs, like six, 4.5, the lowest one is four, which is crazy high. If you have a high activity defense multiplier ADM, then the window in which hostiles can entosis your sovereignty structures is smaller, and it also takes significantly longer to entosis. And this even extends to the timers afterwards once all your entosis nodes spawn for the, the final contest. So having high ADMs in these spaces is super important. And I'm personally impressed with how war-torn this region is that they're able to maintain those high ADMs. So that's definitely a place to keep a look at. Immensi and Tenerife seem to be the, the hotbeds of this conflict down here. We can see that both in terms of timers that have happened and even active timers. If I go to Yeah, we've got some more upcoming timers. Looks like most of them are owned by uh, RC, so the Rogue Consortium, Dreadbomb, those are RC groups. Black Rose is a member of FIRE. Deepwater Hooligans, are they directly involved in one side or the other? I, I, they're not. Last I checked, they weren't part of RC, but they were allied with Dreadbomb, even if they weren't allied with the rest of RC. I think... I think they co-run a rental group with Dreadbomb. I'm not too sure about that. Definitely looks like they're trying to set up their space, so they're trying to make their home region in Immensi. Let me go look and yeah, see if this is if they're able to maintain their ADMs, because that was just something I was talking about, about if you can maintain ADMs in the systems. That's pretty good. Looks like they're keeping this back pocket system, ZBP, pretty high but the rest of their systems are actively being contested. And when you lose sovereignty structures in your system, it does have an impact of resetting those ADMs. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. If you have iHubs flipping back and forth, the ADMs are constantly gonna be at one, 1 1.2, even if people are actively using that space. Yeah, Deepwater Hooligans was one of a couple of syndicate-based alliances that moved to the southeast and started doing stuff alongside Dreadbomb during the war in Delve. And I think they're the only one that really stayed in the southeast. I'm pretty sure that Of Sound Mind moved back to Syndicate. Let's take a look at Syndicate. It is NBC, so I'm going to see absolutely nothing. Let me just quickly check Z-Kill and see what's going on in there. Can you characterize what, there were a couple of groups living in Syndicate, what were they doing there? Like, what was, what was it like? What was life like in Syndicate? I'm not sure. I haven't really paid much attention to Syndicate in a while since I was, not really since I was with EVE University, who has a campus in Syndicate, but I just know that, know of a couple of alliances that have lived there. Like, I, I think know. they... C they moved out not not long after CVA moved in, but I don't think there's a direct connection. Oh man, I haven't thought about CVA in so long. Yeah, we're talking about Wrecking Crew and not about CVA, which is weird. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the history, CVA, Curitas Veritas Alliance, used to be the longtime holders of the region of Providence and they, they lived in that space for years, to the extent that it, it became a joke that Providence is owned by CBA and Probi Block, which was their, their coalition, because nobody else wanted it. Um, the, the driving factor for when that changed happened when all of the stations, the player-owned stations, or player-built stations, excuse me, out in Nullsec, transitioned from stations to Fortazars, those faction Fortazars. That was the incentive that groups like uh, Pandemic Legion needed to come in, start taking space. Uh, Test Alliance also took some space in there and, and did some shenanigans, and it eventually landed in the hands of Wrecking Crew. But um, that's, yeah. that's where CBA comes from, from a historical perspective. 
Yeah, Wrecking Crew what was originally a group of people who hunted supers moving through the nearby Losec regions who had ties to Pandemic Legion. But now they are a full-fledged coalition of their own. Indeed. Looks like the majority of the kills in Syndicate are happening very much on the border zone. So right next to Orville and PFTAC, FDTAC. I recall when I was an MC, we deployed to Syndicate for a bit, and that was definitely the hotbed. I'm, I'm trying to remember which system we lost our Keepstar in. I want to say it was FDTAC is where we had the Keepstar. Emphasis on had before it disappeared. I don't remember. I could, my memory could be completely off. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. All right, let's call that a day for looking at Fireco and the interesting things happening down there. It is definitely the bloodiest conflict ongoing that I know of right now. So if you're looking to go third party on flights, Entosis timers are always fantastic to third party on. But I'm betting, let me head back to my timer board. These guys are happening, oof, starting at 0056, 0345. So these are all late USTZ. And then looks like we have a few belonging to Black Rose in like EUTZ Prime, late EUTZ. So if that's your time zone, you're looking at third party on flights, that might be worth looking into. Uh, somebody in chat says they're coming in late. Who is attacking Fire Coalition? It is a combination of AOM, the Army of Mangoes, and PIBC is your coalition, right? Yeah. Right on. And then they've also teamed up with Dreadbomb who is sort of spearheading the Wrecking Crew coalition side of things. So if I look back at my map, we've got Fireco who originate, like their core, so to speak, is over in this western or eastern side, and they've extended out into the southwest Tenerifice Impasse at Faith of Allah's area. And we've got AOM from Esoteria, Omist, pushing in, so pushing up from the south, and then we've got Dreadbomb and Wrecking Crew from Providence Cash pushing down and out to the west, or out to the east, excuse me. So once again, an area to keep an eye on. It'll be interesting to see how it grows. Uh, we've seen interest from other large power blocks. Test has made their way down. Um, Fraternity has made their way down. Imperium has made their way over. And definitely a, a powder keg that I think could explode at any moment. So I'm keeping a close eye on it. Yeah, I know that I've been in a couple of pandemic horde fleets that have... Uh done some peripheral structure bashing in, in great wildlands of uh, various groups aligned with uh, with uh, fire's enemies and then I've seen then I've seen battle reports of fire fighting RC at the same time hmm yeah, definitely some, some interesting dynamics, and I love to... Man, I don't want to go on this tangent, so I'll just describe the tangent that I would love to go on, which is you can tell a lot from... or sometimes you can tell a lot from which side third parties or which timers third parties show up to and which side they shoot first. Um, groups, as much as they show up as a third party, they do still have a vested interest in terms of who they worked with in the past, who do they have a good relationship with? Who would they rather see survive? Um, there's a, a metagame, so to speak, of different philosophies of how to play EVE and how organizations structure themselves and have diplomacy with others. And so you'll have all of these factors influencing the way that FCs choose who to fight, when to fight, and who to shoot first. And you can tell a lot from it, but then also sometimes you can't. I can say from being a third-party FC, sometimes you show up to these fights and it's very much just, okay, here's the fleet I've got. Which of the fleets on the field is easiest for me to engage and get dank frags? So there's some interesting dynamics going on there I'd love to dig into at some point, but not today. Today we're moving on to Pure Blind. Uh, we mentioned last week there was a State of the Alliance with Brave, and they announced that they were moving into Pure Blind. Looks like their staging has been set up in 5ZX. And I think we're just starting to see the beginning of their real Sov push. Um, yeah, I don't isn't know for five ZX uh, the Mortars Legion pocket. Let me see. You are correct. 
Yeah, I, I remember that because when that's the staging of Bander Logs for a while, they're a Russian group. And when when Pandemic Horde in the first half of last year deployed to Pure Blind, uh, for, uh, they were, after a while, the only group that didn't pack up and move out mainly to closer ties to the Imperium with the groups that packed up and move out. And they were pretty fun to fight, but they quite reasonably didn't always take fly fights if the blob got too big. I can't fault them for that. Fair enough. Yeah, it's interesting dynamics in Pure Blind. Uh, as I understand, it was announced from Brave that they aren't going to be blue with Volta, but they have sort of an understanding with Volta. Uh, so Volta wants fun neighbors so that they sort of have their blessing to move into the space, but that doesn't mean Volta is going to blue them up and help them take it. It's just that Volta isn't going to say, no, you can't live here and put their weight behind the defenders, so to speak, as I understand it. Um, yeah, Pure, Pure Blind's an interesting region because it's the only region with two different NPC factions. Indeed, so I, we've got that Morty's Legion pocket, and then you've also got the Sisters of Eve pocket, right? Right. Uh, the x tac 7 is the most notable system in the Sisters of Eve pocket. Uh, it's... It was uh, the lar the site of the largest fight last year before the war in Delve, and, and it was where it's where a lot of groups have staged when they've been living in the region. And Five ZX, as you mentioned, is the main system of the Mortars Legion pocket. Right on, Shen. For whatever reason, I have it stuck in my brain that when AOM first came to Tranquility, they lived sort of up in this area in Pure Blind. Am I just insane? I wasn't there with them at the time, so I don't know either. Okay. When, also, when did like you join AOM? Summation. Go ahead. Uh, it was uh, April 2020. Well, I, when I joined, they were already in Omist. So I went straight to Ole Miss. Right on. What were you going to say before that? I was going to say, like, um, Pure Blind has one of the only three, I think, connections that directly con connect zero zero to uh, to HiSec. So that's the Torinos and the EC TAC 8 there. And there are two more down in the south in Providence. Uh, that's, so usually what, what happens is there's a no sec gate to low sec, and low sec either to another low sec or low sec to high sec. That's what usually happens, but it, there are some rare cases like this where you have a no-sec gate directly to high sec. Yeah, and what, what does that lead to? What does that mean? Well, it means, well, it, it, like for at least EC tag, it means a lot of gay camp. Uh, uh, I mean, you can see there are uh, gay people set up gay camps uh, right there at, at the EC tag and uh, Torino's case, like basically every day and there are people dying there every day, and you can see a lot of like mobile uh, disruptors. Those those what we call uh, anchor bow bubbles uh, that's being deployed there, and like fleets will often camp there just for fun for roaming fleets and things. Like that. How many other direct null to high sec gates are there? I know the one in two more syndicate and two in Providence, and that's it. So if there's if there one if there's one in Syndicate, then that one that's another one. But like I I know there are two in Providence. Yeah, yeah Syndicate YMP has and the one other. Syndicate has one going from Orville to PF Tac, but I think it's it's worth this making a distinction between Sov Null and NPC Null. Just the level of activity and the level of traffic you're gonna get from high sec to Sov Null versus high sec to NPC Null, they're in completely separate tiers as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one thing that's really worth important uh, this topic, if you go to the Providence one, there's one that goes from pro uh, Provi to, I think, Tash Merkin. Mm -hmm. uh, Kari. Yeah, that's and y -Tac -NP. That's yeah, RC's so that staging. Is, yeah, that one is actually a big, big jump uh, in terms of light years. So people in high sec, they may not recognize the importance of, uh, of regional gates and the difference in light years. So if that gate 
uh, goes to low sec instead of high sec, then there's a chance that people can gate using their capital gate to there and then jump from there. So that would save a lot of uh, fuel. Uh, if you look at the map, um, there's that's a big jump from uh, white tag M to uh, to Cardi. Right on. Like the map, like on on the in, on the universe uh, map, like the, the one shows the actual distance. Oh, you're gonna have to direct me. How do I how do I find this? Uh, I guess you just go to universe. That's it. Like up. Yeah. No, no, like yeah, there. Oh, well, this is cool. So I'm gonna zoom in. I think. Yeah. So we've got Providence right here, center screen, and then. This long purple line going from Tash Mercon yeah. over to Providence it is huge. I'm also seeing a huge one from Catch over to Conid. Yeah, that, that one's another one too. So both of them are really, really big. Wait, and, I, I, wait I think I meant to say the one from Catch to, to Con. I think that, that's the one. Uh, I remember down there somewhere around there, there's a big jump. I, I was going to take that one, but I checked it was, it, it was a high set connection. So I was kind of disappointed. <laughs> Fair enough. For those unfamiliar with capital and super capital mechanics, could you just give us a quick rundown of why these regional gates and the long light year jump is so important? Well, uh, so it's about capital projection, or it's, in other words, like, well, Big Fleet is not going to take that one because um, when you have a, when you're going to go through a gate, um, in low sec it's fine, but in, uh, in all sec there, there are bubbles. So it's not really safe to get your supers, but let's say just for smuggling, uh, especially right before downtime, uh, you can just jump through that gate and then that will save a big chunk of time and fuel. And then uh, there's a capital jump to another Sino. And from there, you're basically safe. And then when downtime hit, your Sino is directly offline. So your Sino is still safe. Right on. And then also from a, a movement and projection perspective, if you can, um, basically, capitals and super capitals are limited in the range they can jump based on light years. For super caps, I think it's like 10 light year or 5 light years, and super regular caps is 10. The numbers have changed over time, so I don't have them off the top of my head. But I think it's 7 and 8. Right on. So oftentimes, the, the span, the distance in light years between one region and another is just too large for that jump to even happen. And if it is small enough for that jump to happen, then your projection within the new region is severely hampered. So if you're in the middle of a region, depending on the size of the region, you could reasonably project your powers, your super capitals, your capitals, even your subcaps if you're doing a Titan bridge, to many systems within that region. Um, but if you're trying to go a region over and there's a long light year distance between them, then you're unable to reach many systems in that new region, if any at all. I believe, if memory serves, one of the, the interesting things about the drone regions is they are so closely clumped together that from a single staging point in the drone regions, you can cover a huge amount of area under a super cap and a capital umbrella. I remember back in the age of Rorquals Online when super caps umbrella were really the, the way you determine how well a power block was doing. There was a big discussion over when the Imperium sort of pioneered this down in Delve, the space isn't particularly ideal for it. They, they do have good coverage, but if they're trying to cover Delve in period basis, they really can't with a single staging. Um, but if you head over here to the drone regions, just visually you can see how close everything is together and the advantage that gives you in terms of the amount of space you can cover with your umbrella. So we'll have yeah. to see as we go into Quadrant 4 if that becomes more important again. Yeah, I, I think I remember reading Aerith say in some context that if he could choose any region of the uh, map to put what they made delve into, he would have done it in Malpais instead. And that yeah. that is in the drone regions. It is. I'm pretty sure that's the, the current staging... I, I don't want to guess. I don't remember anymore. Yeah, the Northern drone regions Coalition, are too confusing for me. It's Northern Coalition's home region right now. Sweet. Okay, so my memory did serve me well in this case. All right, we have gone well off topic, but I think it was worth it because that was some good info there. Uh, we want to focus back again on Pure Blind. 
just a quick recap, if we look at the timer board, Flying Dangerous seems to be the first group to really get their solve hit. You can see again, their ADMs are relatively high, so they're 4 plus, but they're not at like 5 to 6. If I look, take a look at Pure Blind, it's interesting because there's sort of this collage of smaller groups who aren't part of a larger block. If I look at their ADMs, that has some interesting impacts on what the ADMs are going to look like. So 4.5 4 is kind of the base if, you have, if you've held the space for a while and it's reasonably active, it's probably going to be at 4.5. And then higher up into 5 and 6, that tells you the space is actively being used for industry or ratting, what have you. It's being lived in and utilized well. Um, so this area right over here in the, the southeast of Pure Blind is where the first timers have sparked up. It's worth noting it's really close to these entrances, to the, the high sec entrance, to the low sec entrance, to Pure Blind, but not directly adjacent to it, which is curious for me, but I suppose it's, it's useful if you just want to focus on one particular group, because that's the area that's owned by Flying Dangerous. Yeah, I think uh, Pure Blind is possibly the most interesting region because it has of all the regions with NPC space and SOV space, uh, it it's the only one with two different NPC pockets. And, and I think that gives more opportunity for smaller groups to get started in pure blind than any other region to Indeed. get started and get their first bit of SOV. There's a there's a whole other whole other conversation that I'd love to have at some point about how NPC solve is useful for getting started, but then how also it can be really a thorn in your side over time, in terms of allowing other groups to stage and, and attack you constantly. But we'll we'll talk about that another day. I think I'm happy just reviewing Pure Blind. There's activity here from mostly Brave. We've also got the the residents bander logs being a big one. Toilet Paper, Quote Alliance, We Form Volta that we've talked about. Um, so interesting place to keep an eye on. It hasn't started ramping up as fast as I had personally expected. Um, but I suppose there's probably a plan behind why that is. You want to get everybody moved over first and then things can start exploding. Versus if we compare it to the Fire Coalition versus Wrecking Crew and PIBC, those groups already were, were sort of established in those regions. Whereas Brave is moving from Geminate over to Pure Blind. So they've got to move all of their people over, get all of their stuff set up, and establish a beachhead before they can start striking out. So that, that one's going to be simmering for a little while longer, I would expect. All righty. In other news, some groups we've talked about a little bit so far on the show, Fraternity, as well as the Army of Mangoes, uh, had a bit of a fight in Potchven specifically in Nalvula, what used to be a very famous high sex system for ganking and heavily traveled. Now no, part of that, that's Niarcha. Nalvula oh, is, uh, it was the staging system for Dank Guy and Your Dunked, who previous guests on the midweek show, who, who, who their specialty was dropping on their large ships onto and blops is onto expensive ships moving through Kaldari Losek. They were the, the Kaldari Losek area's local super hunters, like how in the southwest you have LSH, in the east you have Ivana, in the southeast that's what Wrecking Crew started out as, like that. Right on. That was Great their correction. staging system where they their main Fortazar that they tethered their supers onto what it was there. Sweet. So in Potchfin, the interesting things to talk about here, I want to quickly double check this kill mail or this battle report has it. Where's the Athenor? So as I understand it, this fight happened over an Athenor that was owned by Fraternity. And Citadels and Potchfin are interesting because if memory serves, the mechanics mean you can't anchor anymore. So any any citadels that were in there are grandfathered in. They existed before the systems were taken by the Triglavians and turned into the Pochfen region. So any citadel that gets destroyed can't be replaced. It's that is irreplaceable. Um, so that was one interesting factor of this fight. The other interesting factor is that we're flying Ahax. Um, 
does unfamiliar Ahax have a very interesting uh, history within the EVE Online culture with... Curator is primary. And that's not a soundboard, that's just uh, his impression of a, a storied FC whose name escapes me. Shadu. Shadu, yeah. Had a fantastic voice, a fantastic style, and just screaming about Ahax. You can find the video if you just Google it. Um, but... Ahax, for those unfamiliar, I should explain the term. They are armor heavy assault cruisers, and what they were known for back in the day is having a very, very tiny SIG, uh, which, if you look at a signature radius, what it means, the smaller it is, the harder it is for people to hit you. Both missiles and turrets, if you have a smaller signature radius, they're going to be doing less damage to you. Um, and that's so... why the classic Ahax Zealot is afterburner fit. Yep, and we, we saw that trend continue here. So if we look at the if we look at the kill mails, they are fit with afterburners, which is awesome to see. They now have the ADCs new to the heavy assault cru cruiser class. But then they also had long projection. So if you're afterburner fit, it's very difficult for you to control the range against your target. They could be micro warp drive fit, they could go much, much faster than you, which means you have to rely on the ability to project your damage to a long range which is why you're seeing them fit with heavy beam lasers. And I was surprised when I first looked at this battle report that we were seeing Deimos, um, which the bonuses on the ship itself are to self-repair versus like uh, buffer or their resistances, which is more common for fleet-oriented ships. And Shen, do I remember right that you had some info on, on why we see Deimoses in these AHAC fleets? Yeah. Yeah, so with AHAX, first of all, you want armor tanks. So uh, the other um, options for that non-energy uh, beam weapons, uh, there's not really anything else other than the demos uh, to, to be armor tanked, uh, but also have a, a, a weapon system that's not energy turret. So the reason why energy turret in this case is so important is that any energy turret instead of uh, unlike um, the projectile and the missiles, they can only deal one type of damage, and that is thermal and EM. And so that means your enemy can, if they know ahead of time that you're going to do um, a, a zealot fleet, uh, if it's complete zealot, then they can just tank those two resistance to its max. That means you're going to apply DPS. Uh, you, that means your guns is going to apply very poor DPS, uh, which means that it's not going to be very effective uh, using Dark Doctrine, which means that uh, uh, mixing in with some uh, demoses will help fix that problem, essentially. Uh, the demoses are uh, fitted with real guns, which means that they deal uh, kinetic and thermal damage, which is uh, what there is a thermal lap overlap, but uh, it's way better than just pure EM and thermal. Yeah, and thermal is, on average, the one you're likely to see the lowest native resists on, unless people specifically tank for thermal, so that's not as big a deal as it would be for another damage type. Yeah, and specifically, like, if you're, if you're shooting zealots in your dimos, the zealots with the Amar T2 resist profile, thermal is their lowest resist, so that's a, a great resist to target. You're also looking at the logistics wing, for an AHAC fleet. You're mainly looking at Guardians, as I understand it. Looks like we've also got some Oneroses in here, yeah. but the Guardians share that thermal hole in their resistance profile. Yeah, the, the including Deimoses in AHACs, that was a thing I started seeing a lot when uh, Volta became a NullSec Alliance last year, and uh, that w was one of their... In, quickly what became one of their main doctrines walk me through again what was the doctrine the ahax the zealots that we're talking about ah right on and yeah, that, was that that was that qu was quickly one of their main doctrines and then i quick i also started seeing them mix in uh demos is pretty early on Fair enough. Hirebrand asks in the Twitch chat, why don't you use, or could you use, heavy missile sacrileges? The sacrilege is the other Amar heavy assault cruiser, also very tanky, has the bonuses that you would expect for a, a, a fleet ship, a ship to be used in fleet combat. It's slower than its other Kaidi counterparts, its other missile counterparts, which is why you don't see it used as often as a Cerberus. 
but the reason that you would not use a sacrilege in an AHAC fleet is the the difference in how the ships apply damage. So turrets, projectiles, uh, lasers, hybrids, those sorts of things have instant damage application. You click the module, damage occurs. Missiles, there's a delay. When you fire the missile, it has to travel through space very quickly, but there still is that travel time to when it finally hits the target. And so if you're trying to have them both follow the same primary, and specifically if you're in a large enough battle where you're trying to volley or kill the ships before the logistics wing has time to rep them, then when that damage hits and making sure it all hits at the same time is very important. Um, there's also some stuff going on with put the potential for missiles to be firewalled, which I don't think is very common in the meta anymore, but that's also something to keep in mind. So that's, that's probably the reason you're not seeing sacrileges here, is that difference in when the damage is applied. If you've ever flown in a Cerberus fleet, um, depending on your FC, they probably called for certain volleys. Cerberuses will often engage 100 to 150 kilometers away, which means even though your missiles fly at multiple kilometers per second, it's still going to take a few seconds for them to land. Um, so they will call, do this many cycles of your missiles, and then swap to a target before their initial primary is even dead because they're expecting, they've done the math in their head, this is how much EHP my target has, this is how much damage I do with each of my volleys, I'm gonna fire this many volleys and then trust that it's gonna die and move on to the next one. And it's super tough for logistics pilots to manage broadcasts that way. It's actually helpful um, for the Cerberus in that meta, but it's also a, a tactic that you have to learn as an FC and something that your fleet members have to really be on the ball of in terms of following their primaries and following instructions during the fleet. All right, any other, you know what, Shen, do you have more info on what was going on with the Zathnor? I thought this was interesting because the AHAX, but I'm sure there's more going on to this story, right? Yeah, it's just a timer, I guess, in parchment. Also, another thing about AHAX uh, that I would like to mention is um, when repairing AHAX uh, using Guardians. So uh, that's the difference between shield rep and armor rep. Uh, shield rep will happen at the moment you press the button, F1 or F2 or F3, but armor rep only happens at the end of the cycle. So sometimes what's going to happen is your ship will get um, uh, volleyed off right away. So like one round of uh, a gun from uh, the enemy fleet. That means the uh, uh, your, your, your logics can't even rep you on time. So it has to wait for that five or six seconds of the rep cycle to go through until the rep actually gets on you. So that's another big, big thing. Um, what well, big difference between shield and armor hack fleet. Yeah, right on. All right, interesting stuff to see in Pochfen with these groups who aren't necessarily known to be Pochfen residents, or that's not their, their main uh, goal in EVE Online. So you've got Snuffed Out, Army of Mangoes versus Fraternity. Oh, it looks like Rote Capel was there in Bombers as well, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, Ro interesting Ro Ro little fight. is pretty active in Pochfen. Oh. A right lot on. of groups are have interests in Pochfen, but are fairly secretive since uh, Pochfen is a it it has a reputation for being a place where you can make a lot of money, but people don't want to ruin that with competition. Fair enough. I think I recall Setonia on one of our Sunday shows explaining it like the, the way to make the crazy amounts of money is if you sort of control or have everybody else working with you in terms of leaving the sites available for you to chain them one after another after another because there's sort of a cap to the number of these high-end sites that will ever spawn and, and you want to be able to chain them one after the other versus if there's competition in there they could go in and try and take it from you, or they could be trying to kill you, because Pochfin is effectively null sex space in terms of its uh, security. So it just very interesting dynamics. Security by obscurity definitely seems to be the, the meta that these groups are using, which is pretty cool to mention. Thank you for that, Gregor. All righty, moving um, on. Another thing oh, I ahead. recently learned about Pochfin is locator agents find people in Pochfin, which... I did not know. I thought it was like I thought I expected it to be like a wormhole where uh, if 
where you can't you, locator agents can't find someone in a wormhole at all. And they'll tell you that they can't find this person, which is how you know he's in a warhole. Indeed. We're, locator agents are, are super valuable tools that aren't used very often, and definitely probably a discussion at Deep Dive on a future show. But it is an interesting tidbit to bring up. Alright, and other interesting tidbits to bring up. In my own personal gameplay, I've been using this website, uh, anoik.is, which I personally use it because when I'm exploring wormhole space, as you come across a new wormhole, it will either show K162, which means that it originated from the other side, or it will show one of these other codes, which I have in this, um, this table. And what you can do is, without even jumping in to the other wormhole, if you have a reference for what these codes mean, you can tell what's probably going to be on the other side. So if I'm exploring out of my C2, and I happen upon an N062 wormhole, I know that it's going into a C5. And that, that will give me a little bit of information in terms of what to expect. Is this worth jumping into? Do I care? Can I roll it? Stuff like that. So this is just a really cool website I've been using a lot. Um, this table in particular is something historically I would just Google Eve and then the wormhole code, which takes a whole lot more time than just looking at a table and finding it and it's color coded, which is awesome. Oh yeah, um, I, I used to use that site a lot when I li was living in Eve University's C2 wormhole. It, it's a great tool. Yeah, and uh, speaking of which, they also have this cool thing they're doing with their EVE partner skins. So they are a, a member of the EVE partnership program, and it seems the way that you get the skins is you just, every month, they set out a number of systems, and if you happen to land in one of those systems and you're logged in so that they can tell that you're actually there, then you can redeem it which is really freaking cool. Um, and I wanted to bring it up because this month, the month of October, are the VEDMAX skins, which I'm expecting to be super popular, which also means they're going to be super valuable. So if you're interested in procuring one of these VEDMAX skins, this might be one way to do it, especially if you're already a resident of Wormhole Space who is out there exploring, or maybe you're a day tripper who goes in there for the gas or for the relic and data sites. So far, the market has, for the the partner skin, the the Astero has been the one that has had the most value on the market, which I always think it's kind of funny when people w really want a skin for a cloaky ship. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be cloaky. Back when I did the, the Faction Warfare frigate stuff, uh, the Astero was a very popular ship that you, people would either fit newts or they'd fit blasters or auto cannons in those high slots instead of using the cloak because it didn't matter if you were in a faction warfare plex you couldn't cloak all right apart from that we had some super interesting ccp news today a really unexpected dev blog from my perspective and one that's not the normal kind of dev blog you see uh, it's called quasar setting course for eve forever uh, this is they do a great job of contextualizing what Quasar is in terms of other technical projects you've seen in the past. But effectively, Quasar is, as I understand it from this dev blog, an initiative to change the way certain features and functions of EVE Online are managed in terms of the EVE server versus other cloud infrastructure. And the implications you can see through that is, number one, faster response times, because the EVE server has limitations through Python, as I understand correctly, in terms of what can happen. It's all single-threaded. Versus if you use this other cloud infrastructure to host different assets or different functions and features, then it can happen much faster and be a more modern experience. You can also utilize different server hardware that's multi-threaded. So it's super cool. I think the biggest takeaway is number one, if you're just a server database nerd or you like cool stuff, then definitely it's worth a read. Half the words I didn't understand and had to Google, but it was still fun to read because I, I enjoy EVE Online. And they do a really good job of connecting it to what we as players see in terms of changes to the game. So they went through like, what does this enable us to do? Which is really freaking cool. Um, as an example, the activity tracker, opportunities, the cool um, abyssal proving ground leaderboard, all of that stuff is 
able to happen and be in, be as cool as it is because of what Project Quasar, so to speak, allows them to do. Also, no downtime is another side effect of Quasar as it gets further and further into things because they can offload stuff from the server. They don't need to take the server down to patch it, to update it, to, to make changes, which is really freaking cool. So I'm, I'm really glad they brought this out and they showed it to us. Um, it, I think it really shows the long-term investment that CCP has in EVE Online and the, the cool things that they're doing along the way, even if I probably don't fully understand it. You guys have any have any takes on this? Yeah, a lot of it, it's it is going a bit over my head. I mean, I've been recently got back in school taking classes in this sort of thing, but in, in the IT and network stuff that they talked about, but I haven't really gotten that far yet. Right on. Yeah, they talk a lot about this gRPC as a, a component that is really enabling them to benefit from this style of managing things, um, which I don't... They, they explain what it stands for. It honestly goes beyond my head, but it's, it's really cool. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, or you're just interested in EVE and what EVE's technical future looks like, and how the game could change over time, definitely worth your time, but I, I very much appreciate it. All right, that'll do it. Unless anybody have any final thoughts, anything we missed in today's show you want to talk about? Yeah, I think it's interesting that they're trying to make this last forever because MMOs, as much as they uh, try to be permanent game worlds for as long as they last, are usually not... A, the, usually the businesses operating them don't in, expect them to last forever and and just uh, want to make the most of them while they're still around until they eventually uh, stop being worth the cost of oper running the servers. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, Eve, Eve Forever is... I forget when it first started, when... Um... Hilmar came on stage and was like walking through all the different Eve IPs and it's like this is we're gonna keep this going it's gonna go on they had like the infinity symbol man my memory sucks but it was really cool it's nice to see it's also for me as a player nice to hear about because we're constantly hearing about other MMOs World of Warcraft Final Fantasy 14 um, our new world new worlds just came out even Elder Scrolls Online, they, they are long-running MMOs, for some of them, but even still you get this impression that uh, the way that they're being run isn't in the same, doesn't have the same perspective that EVE Online does. I think EVE Online is older than most of them, um, and it also, very much you can tell from this sort of communication and from the communication we get at FanFest or Vegas back in the day or other sorts of EVE meets, that they're not only committed to maintaining the game, but to even dramatically reinventing stuff as fundamental as the, the technical, how is the game built, how does it function, how is it hosted, how do players connect to it, which is really freaking cool. Yeah, I think the only MMO that might be older than Eve that is still popular is RuneScape. Both I uh, both launched in two thousand three, if I recall correctly. Yeah, right on. Or actually, RuneScape was a year or two before that. It's big rework that, uh, the the engine that it used during its golden age was two thousand three. Cool, yeah. Alrighty, well that'll do it for tonight's episode of Talking Stations. Tomorrow, as I understand it, we're going to be doing some more industry stuff. So if you're uh, itching for a new update on industry and digging into that details, be on the lookout for tomorrow. Also got some interesting things yeah, coming tomorrow. up Thursday. Go ahead, Chen. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to do capital ship industry or capital ship manufacturing. That will include the ships themselves, that will include the modules and some fighters, and basically everything you know around capital ship production. Well, that's awesome. 
I'm super, I'm gonna tune into that one. Um, well, not live, because I have work, but I'm gonna make sure to, to watch it as soon as possible afterwards, because I've been trying to wrap my head around, we did the show on reactions, and I've since started up a reaction chain, and now I'm looking at the stuff I'm producing, and I'm like, this is used for building capitals and battleships, but I don't understand that production chain and how it works. So I'm, I'm going to tune in and see what yeah, I can I, learn. I, I do a lot of reactions. And uh, so w which reactions did you start? Did you start up uh, with moon goo or, ga or wormhole gas or drug gas? I wanted to start with moon goo, but I ended up using wormhole gas just because um, I am in getting into industry to learn, not to, to make the most amount of money. And so I didn't have access to a large variety of moon goo, but I did have access to a large variety of wormhole gas. So that's what I'm that's what I'm diving into. Yeah. When I first started reactions, I was doing wormhole gas because I lived in a wormhole and I needed I just started doing reactions because it reduced the volume I needed to ship out of the hole. And but when I restarted them in Pandemic Horde, it was easier to get Moon Goo, so that's what I've been running since. And then the reason why I started doing Tech Two production a bit later was because I wasn't always selling them f fast enough to buy replacement Moon Goo, so I just built ship hulls and modules to sell. Right on. All righty. Well, definitely some interesting stuff to keep an eye out for. We'll see you tomorrow.